Hey everybody, Professor Bob Long here doing your AMP videos. Um, this lecture, uh, or this video, is going to cover my respiratory system lecture number six, which is, I believe, going to be our final one. What we're going to cover in this lecture is going to be um, control of respiration. How does the brain control our breathing rate? And then some factors that affect control of our breathing rate, things that can speed it up or slow it down under abnormal circumstances. And then we're going to cover the um, respiratory volumes, how much air can our lungs hold, how much can we inhale and exhale under certain circumstances. So this should complete our note set. If you're in my class, those of you that are in my class, you know I published my note set so that you guys can follow along. Uh, we're going to be covering what's on the bottom of page 74 and then on to page 75. So follow along. It's, it, it's much more complex than I'm going to give you, but I'm going to try to simplify it for this level. You can add complexity as you go up and up through your programs. Okay. So let me get the, the initial premise set up. So as you know, our brain and our spinal cord, our ner central nervous system, has a con major control over a lot of systems in the body. And then down here, we're going to have our two little lungs and our thoracic cavity. We talked about the thoracic cavity and inhalation, exhalation, pressures and volumes and things. Now, there are two major respiratory systems. Up here, we would have the pons, and there's a, there's a respiratory, sy not systems, but respiratory sensors. There's one that's up in the pons called the pontine. It's supposed to be an O there. The pontine respiratory group. The pontine respiratory group gets its name from the fact that it's in the pons. And then there's one down in the medulla called the medullary respiratory center or group. These two centers are each subdivided into two smaller centers, and they're going to affect our breathing rate. So now I'm going to erase the names up there, the pontine and the medullary. You'll hear those terms thrown around. They just mean the pons or the medulla. I'm going to draw the pons and medulla slightly larger over here. Okay, I'm going to draw them on this edge for a reason. So there's our pons, there's the medulla of the brain, and then we're going to have some higher centers up here. <clears throat> so the pontine group is divided into two subgroups. One group is called the apneustic center, and the other group is called the pneumotaxic center. We're going to come back to these two groups in just a moment, but those two respiratory centers control or affect our breathing rate. Down in the medulla, we have two. One is more in the front and one is more in the back. The one in the back is called the dorsal respiratory group. I'm going to put DRG for dorsal respiratory group. Dorsal, as you know, is the same as posterior. It's behind. The one in the front is called the ventral respiratory group, and I have it abbreviated as VRG. That's supposed to be an R there. Let me rewrite that a little bit bigger. The ventral respiratory group, because it's more anterior or ventral. Now, essentially, the dorsal respiratory group is going to affect the muscles that cause inhalation and or exhalation to some degree. Okay, so... Um, now, I'm going to use two colors, and I'm going to use some symbols here for you guys to follow along. If I use, you know, usually green means go. So anytime I use green and or a plus sign, that's going to mean that it stimulates something. So to stimulate something means it's going to make it fire. Let me rewrite that because it didn't come out very good. But there's stimulate. Anytime I have some red lines and a negative that's going to inhibit something from firing or working okay so here's how it goes the dorsal respiratory group itself usually is considered to be an inspiratory center what that means is the neurons of the dorsal respiratory group are going to exit the spinal cord through and or exit through the vagus nerve um, cranial nerve 10 <clears throat> And then there will be branches called the phrenic, phrenic, phrenic for diaphragm, phrenic, and the um, intercostal nerves, which go to the intercostal muscles. I'm not going to get to that level of detail. But essentially, the axons here are going to come out, and they're going to, in, they're going to cause the inspiratory muscles to contract. They're going to stimulate them. So what we would have here is what would be called inspiration, or we inhale. 
We would contract the external intercostals and the diaphragm, and we would inhale. Now, the medullary respiratory center, its two centers actually affect the dorsal respiratory group. So I like to think of it this way, okay? The apneustic center stimulates the dorsal respiratory group. It tells it to fire to inhale. The pneumotaxic center says no, pneumo, no. The pneumotaxic center is going to inhibit the dorsal respiratory group. It's supposed to be a little negative sign there, but it's going to inhibit the dorsal respiratory group from inhaling. And when we stop inhaling, we exhale. Okay, so the apneustic center turns it on, says go ahead. The pneumotaxic center says no, stop inhaling, and you exhale. That would be quiet respiration. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, exhale. Okay. Now, the dorsal respiratory group itself, under certain circumstances, because there are smaller groups of neurons within you, I believe the best ventral respiratory group has like four different groups of neurons that all have different effects. But essentially, the ventral respiratory group is going to fire the muscles of forced exhalation. It's going to help you force out extra air. So it's only going to be necessary when we're in active respiration or hypertonia. So, and the dorsal respiratory group can help activate the ventral respiratory group in some systems, in some situations. Essentially, these two guys are going to work together or communicate, and I'm just going to put a little line between them so that you kind of know that they can come work together or communicate. Now, here are some alternate factors that can affect our respiratory rhythmicity center. So if I look up at the brain itself, if I want to get really, you know, detailed, I could go to certain specific parts of the brain, but I'm not going to. But essentially, our higher sensors in the brain, higher brain sensors, things for stuff like emotion, pain, some of the sensors that are detecting temperature, and the speech area of the brain. When we speak, we have to alter our breathing patterns. All of these areas here can essentially go and affect the medullary respiratory center. And neurons from those centers can do one of two things. They can excite or they can also inhibit the medullary center, altering our breathing patterns. So under certain emotions, if you're crying, you're <laughs> well, they can increase the rate at which you're breathing. Pain and temperature can increase our breathing rate. As you know, um, our body temperature, we exhale a lot of heat, um, so it can help cool us. So that's why animals pant when they're hot. They're <laughs> We're getting rid of excess heat through there. And then when we speak, we have to alter our breathing patterns when we inhale, when we exhale. Now, another area that can affect our respiratory centers is other parts of the brain, but a little bit lower, um, would be things like the hypothalamus and the medulla. Those two areas can detect a number of things. They're detecting ion concentration, but they have some chemoreceptors that can detect changes in pH. If your blood pH starts to drop, becomes acidic, remember, your normal blood pH range is somewhere between 7.35 and 7.45. If your pH starts to drop below 7.35, you're becoming acidic. So, and when we're acidic, that means we have too many hydrogen ions. What causes that is an increase or buildup of carbon dioxide. So when carbon dioxide is building up and when, you know, hard hydrogen ions, you know, carbon dioxide combines with water to form carbonic acid, which dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. When we start to produce too many hydrogen ions, we become acidic. Our pH drops below 7.3. You're now in acidosis. Well, when we enter acidosis, one of the things that happens is I have to breathe out the excess carbon dioxide, reversing all these chemical reactions. So the neurons there can certainly stimulate the medullary respiratory centers or the medullary um, respiratory rhythmicity centers that affect 
the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group. Remember, the ventral respiratory group is going to do forced exhalation. And it will stimulate the muscles that cause you to force your air out. Okay. So another thing that can affect this, and really we're monitoring this. This must be really important because we have several backup sensors for almost the exact same thing. So look. Now, if I start looking at the heart itself, the aorta comes out of the heart. It has branches, brachiocephalic, right and left, right common carotid, right subclavian, the left common carotid, the left subclavian. Well, we talked about this before, but there's several centers here, and there's some chemoreceptors in the aortic body and in the carotids, called the carotic and aortic carotid body, and the aortic bodies. They're also measuring the exact same thing. They will detect an increase in hydrogen ions, which is a decrease in pH, you become acidic, or an increase in carbon dioxide. One other thing that they are actually sensitive to is a decrease in oxygen. If I'm not getting enough oxygen to my tissues, they're going to increase our breathing rate. So the carotid and aortic bodies and the carotid arteries and the aortic artery are also measuring the exact same thing as the medulla and hypothalamus. Decreased pH, or an increased hydrogen ions, increased carbon dioxide, or they also can be triggered by not enough oxygen being pumped to your tissues. Those neurons are going to go and they're going to stimulate the medullary um, respiratory center which will alter our breathing patterns, giving us forced exhalation and increasing the rate at which we're breathing, cause you to breathe faster and harder to reverse these effects. Also, another backup to this whole thing. So let's say I'm looking at uh, someone's lower body and their legs or any part of the body. In here, I have muscle. My skeletal muscles, when they increase activity, the skeletal muscles are going to be generating more carbon dioxide. They're going to burn oxygen faster, generate more carbon dioxide. Therefore, the muscle spindle fibers will detect increased muscle activity, and they will also stimulate not the ventral respiratory group, but the respiratory rhythmicity center. Remember, the ventral respiratory group is going to be here. It's going to do some forced exhalation. Okay? Now, so these are several things that are going to alter our respiratory patterns so that we can adjust our body to keep our pH within our range. Our respiratory system has a huge effect on pH by exhaling the carbon dioxide. So all of these would help us, you know, reverse respiratory acidosis. As we get more active and carbon dioxide builds up in tissues, those excess hydrogen ions from the conversion of carbon dioxide into bicarbonate ion. The bicarbonate ion can be dealt with but if we continue to do it too rapidly, the hydrogen ions build up, we go into respiratory acidosis, then we have to breathe a little faster to try to get rid of the carbon dioxide. So um, now that's not everything that affects this, but now that you have this part down and you think about that, we're going to look at the respiratory system itself. It can also affect its own patterns. Um, so we're going to get into the respiratory reflexes. What Essentially, what I want you guys to walk away knowing is this. The dorsal respiratory group causes inspiration under quiet respiration. It's functioning normally. Sorry, I'm trying to slide my chair. Got caught on a tile. Um, the medullary rhythmicity center, the medullary respiratory center, has two parts, apneustic and pneumotaxic. They are controlling the dorsal respiratory group for inhalation and exhalation. The apneustic center causes you to inhale. The pneumotaxic center shuts down inhalation, which stops us um, breathing. Um, or doesn't stop you breathing. It stops inhalation so that you exhale under quiet respiration. Now, <clears throat> all of these other factors are going to affect respiration. The ventral respiratory group, what I want you to know about it is when it's stimulated, you're going to get forced exhalation. And so all of these other things that we talked about, the higher centers, can alter our rhythmicity center, particularly the any time we build up carbon dioxide, hydrogen ions, we lower our pH or lower the oxygen in our tissues, 
we're going to have to breathe faster. They're going to fire on the medullary rhythmicity center, increase the rate and the stimulus of the dorsal respiratory group, also causing the ventral respiratory group to fire, which causes the forced exhalation. So we get that rapid, deep breathing to reverse these effects and get back into our normal range of pH and oxygen level in our tissues. Okay? So now that's all page 74 stuff. Really what I want you to know, if you, if you have my notes set, I want you to know what's on page 74. Okay? Now, <clears throat> last page, page 75 of the notes set. We're going to talk about some of the respiratory reflexes. The respiratory system itself can affect its own breathing rate. So I'm going to erase all of this. I hope you got it all down. If not, rewatch the video several times. But if I start to overinflate a lung, if I start to inhale and inhale and inhale and inhale, if I overinflate a lung, I could rip some of the tissues and cause tears, and then the lungs would not be able to function. Um, so there's a thing called the uh, inflation reflex, or sometimes called the, um, oops, I left the L out, the uh, inhalation reflex. The inflation reflex basically stops overinflation. It can stop inhalation if you inhale too much. You don't want to over inhale and rip the lungs. We cause the inflation reflex, by the way, sometimes is also called the Herring Brewer reflex. So the Herring Brewer reflex. It's the same thing as the inflation reflex. It stops overinflation of the lungs. Your lungs have some baroreceptors, some pressure receptors or stretch receptors that detect the stretch and make you inhale. Um, sorry, exhale. You can't overinflate the lungs even if you try. The exact opposite of that is called the deflation reflex. If I over deflate the lungs, they'll pull away from the walls of the cavity and collapse. So if I continue to blow air out, no matter how hard I try to force it, my body will override it and stop me. So those are reflexes. We talked about the chemoreceptor reflexes that are on page 75, and we went through all the different chemoreceptors that are going to fire and alter breathing rate. And then we have what are called the protective reflexes. If anything is going to irritate the respiratory passages, the trachea, the bronchi, or the lungs themselves, let's say you're walking into a dust storm or you breathe in some dirt and debris or dander or, um, or a tree pollen and it's irritating your lungs, we can have several... Um, uh, reflexes that will help us try to expel that sneezing, coughing, and hacking things out, and then kicking off the mucus escalator to a higher degree to push all that stuff out. So those are the protective reflexes, okay? Um, sneezing and coughing to expel things. Uh, so that's it for how the lungs or how the respiratory tract itself monitors itself. So we have an inflation reflex that stops over inflation. We have a deflation reflex that stops over deflation, and they fire back on these centers and shut off um, the processes. And then we have the coughing and sneezing. Okay. Now, I'm going to erase all this because the very last thing we have to do is we need to know about some breathing volumes. And those of you that go into nursing in particular, and if you do OTA and PTA, you're going to need to know some exercise physiology, kinesiology majors. But really, respiratory therapists are going to deal with this a lot. The numbers I'm going to give you are the numbers as I learned them from the textbook that I use. I've, I just, you know, I've reviewed like five or six te different textbooks and they all use very slightly different numbers. They're ballpark range. But really what's important is you understand the definitions of these terms. So I'm going to write some words and some, some um, definitions and some numbers on the board. And then we're going to talk about them and draw this out. So... One of these things is called TV, which stands for tidal volume. So if you go to the beach, the tide comes in, the tide goes out. So these are volumes of inhalation and exhalation. And for the average healthy adult, the average tidal volume, if you were sitting quietly with your eyes closed and meditating, you would breathe in a certain amount of air and breathe out a certain amount of air, and it would be roughly 500 milliliters for the average healthy adult. Okay? So now... There's a way that we do this. We can hook a machine up to your chest that has some stretchers in it that fire off on a, th on a, a physiograph, and then that will cause some needles on the physiograph to move. So um, if I were to looking at this in some sort of graph, then I would see that you inhale and exhale 
a certain amount with every breath. And that would be your tidal volume, about 500 milliliters. Every time you inhale, the needle goes up. Every time you exhale, the needle goes down. Now, if you were inhaling, by the way, the definition of the tidal volume is the volume of air moving in and out of the lungs under normal breath and quiet respiration, or the volume of air moving in and out of the lungs during eupnea, quiet respiration. Now, let's say you're inhaling and you've inhaled that normal 500 milliliters. What if you need more oxygen? On top of just your normal inhalation, you could bring in a whole bunch of extra air and then come back down to your tidal volume, okay? All of that is going to be called the inspiratory reserve volume. IRV stands for inspiratory reserve volume. You know, when you have something in reserve, it's what you have in case you need to tap into it. So if I need to, I have all this extra air to tap into. Now, different books use different numbers, but essentially it's somewhere between 3,000 and 3,200 milliliters and so the way that I learned inspiratory reserve volume was that it's around 3,100 milliliters, okay, on top of your tidal volume. Now, if you were inhaling and exhaling and you decided at the end of an exhale, you got the normal amount of air out of the lungs and you tried to exhale even more, you could get a certain amount of air out of the lungs. That's called the expiratory reserve or ERV. ERV stands for expiratory reserve volume. And I'm not going to write the word volume out again. And for the average normal healthy adult, if this is 500 and this is 3,100 milliliters, this is somewhere around 1,200 milliliters, okay? The expiratory reserve volume is around 1,200 milliliters of air. So if I needed to get excess carbon dioxide out on top of my normal exhalation, I could blow out that much extra air. And then there's a certain amount of air that's just left in the lungs that we can't get out. That's just the sort of the dead volume that's in there. And we call that the residual volume. As you know, a residue is anything that's left over when you burn something up or use something up. So we call this the residual volume. So the residual volume for the average normal healthy adult is somewhere around 1,200 milliliters. Okay, so I normally breathe in and out 500 milliliters, 500 in, 500 out, 500 in, 500 out. If I inhale on top of my tidal volume, the extra amount of or the extra volume of air that I can inhale on top of a normal breath is called the inspiratory reserve volume. That amount of air that I can tap into in reserve that I can inhale if necessary. The expiratory reserve volume is that volume of air that can be exhaled in addition to the normal tidal volume. So that's going to be somewhere around 1,200 milliliters. So after I exhale, it's the extra air I can exhale if I need to tap into that reserve. The residual volume is how much air is left in your lung that you don't ever get in and out, and it's around 1,200 milliliters. So that leads us to some other definitions. We have tidal volume, we have inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve, and residual volume. I'm going to erase those, and I'm going to rewrite them just kind of shorter and neater over here, okay? So, tidal volume is 500 milliliters. Inspiratory reserve volume is about somewhere around 3,100 milliliters. Again, different books will vary by 100 milliliters or so. Some books, I think, say 3,000. Some say 3,200. So it's around 3,100. Expiratory reserve volume is 1,200 milliliters. And then the residual volume is 1,200 milliliters. And these are approximate numbers. And they're going to vary based on the person's height, size, gender, and all sorts of other things. Okay, That leads us to some other definitions. One is called the inspiratory capacity. How much air can you inhale normally? All of the air that you can inhale. Well, the inspiratory capacity is going to be your tidal volume, how much you're normally inhaling, 
plus your inspiratory reserve, and that's going to be somewhere around 3,600 milliliters. That's the total amount that you could inhale with your normal breath and the reserve added together. There's another thing called expiratory capacity. How much total air could you expire if necessary? Okay. Now, a lot of books don't talk about the expiratory capacity, but it's going to be these two, tidal volume plus your expiratory reserve, somewhere around 1,700 milliliters. Now, I'm going to erase this one because it's really not talked about in our textbook, and it's not really in my notes. Yet. Now, there's another one that we are going to talk about called the vital capacity. As you know, vita means life, and how much air could I breathe in and out combined total if I needed to go to all the extremes to stay alive. That's going to be your tidal volume plus your inspiratory reserve volume plus your expiratory reserve. I could tap into this if I need extra oxygen. I could tap into that if I need to exhale extra carbon dioxide. And when you add them up, it's going to be about 4,800 milliliters. It's your 3,100, 500, and 1,200 there. It gives you that. Um, 3100. So these two together are in inspiratory capacity. All three of these are your vital capacity. And that leads us to the last one, which is called the total lung capacity. What is the total amount of air that your lungs could handle? And it's really all of this. It's about six liters, okay, or 6,000 milliliters. It is the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve, plus the expiratory reserve, plus the residual volume, or all of these added up. When you do the math, 31 plus 500 is 36, 4,800, 6,000. 6,000 milliliters or 6 liters, essentially. Now, what you guys need to walk away, and I'm going to repeat this one more time, and then we're done with the respiratory system. You need to know the definitions. The tidal volume is the amount of air that is inhaled and exhaled under quiet respiration or a normal breath. The inspiratory reserve is the amount of air that you can inhale in addition to your tidal volume. Expiratory reserve is the amount of air that you can exhale in addition to your tidal volume and on top of that. Residual volume is the amount of air left in the lungs even if you were dead. That's why when you press on a dead person, you get some air out, but it's almost always there. The inspiratory capacity is how much air could you inhale if you really needed all of it to get all the oxygen you need. It's tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve. Your vital capacity is how much air could you breathe in and out should you need to breathe in everything that you can to get on all the oxygen, get out all the carbon dioxide, and it's these three together. Inspiratory reserve plus the tidal volume, plus the expiratory reserve. That's your vital capacity, how much you can tap into to stay alive. Total lung capacity is what is the total volume of air that the lungs can handle? And it's about six liters. It's a little less for the average individual, but these are the numbers we're using. And that's your tidal volume, plus your inspiratory reserve, plus your expiratory reserve, plus your residual volume. So now, if you're in my class, there'll be worksheets coming. You can fill in the note set. You need to know these definitions and understand them. And then um, there'll be some quizzes coming online. I don't normally do online classes. As you all know, we're in this uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus outbreak, and I'm having to switch everything to online. So stay safe. If you can, stay home. Sanitize your hands. Wash your hands when you touch things or interact with the public. And do the whole social distancing thing until this all gets under control and the whole world can go back to normal, hopefully. Who knows what's going to happen when the next pandemic comes around. But nonetheless, um, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. I hope you had as much fun as I did because I just love talking about this stuff. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. All right? If you're not in my class, I hope you learned something or I hope it made your lectures and your PowerPoints or whatever it is that you do um, a little easier to understand. Thanks for watching.